What's up, future respiratory therapists, and especially to Teresa Gray, who has sent in two questions who I can answer in one video. So I appreciate that. These questions and this video is directed towards you and anybody else that can learn from it. Future respiratory therapists, current respiratory therapists, old-time respiratory therapists, anybody who wants to learn today about respiratory alkalosis and how we treat it, this video is for you. Lots of questions all the time roll in about different blood gas treatments. How do we fix this? How do we fix that? Now, today's video is specifically about respiratory alkalosis. This is when you have a low CO2, a normal bicarb, and a high pH. We don't even have to talk about the PaO2 right now. When you talk about an uncompensated respiratory alkalosis, you're talking about a patient who's acutely at the alveolar level hyperventilating. Okay, lots of things lots of things can cause this: hypoxemia, anxiety, pain, just to name a few. So, how do we know what the problem is? Well, let's break this down. Now, this comes from a previous video that I posted about a respiratory alkalosis patient. I don't remember what those numbers were, so I'm not going to talk about that video specifically. I'm going to address it from a new set of numbers. Let's look at this ABG we have here on the board. We've already said, we've already established that we have an uncompensated respiratory alkalosis. Now, we know that when we look at an ABG, we always fix ventilation first and then oxygenation, which means if your CO2 is out of range, make a ventilator change or make a therapeutic change that will fix your CO2 and then make an oxygenation change. That's the general rules when approaching theory-based respiratory therapy going into preparation for your MBRC exams. So for example, if you had somebody with a high CO2 and a low pH and also a low PaO2, the first answer would be to fix the respiratory acidosis, not to fix the hypoxemia. Doesn't make sense? Doesn't matter. That's the rules. Okay? Now, this is the asterisk that is the side note. She does. She does do that. In this case, we have a patient who is hyperventilating. Their CO2 is down. Their bicarb is normal. They are alkalotic on their pH. This is an uncompensated respiratory alkalosis, also known as acute alveolar hyperventilation. Now, why is this patient acutely hyperventilating? The answer is right here. They are hypoxemic. The hypoxemia is stimulating all of the receptors to say, I need more oxygen. So they're stimulating increased respiratory rate, increased tidal volume, those together increase minute volume, and they result in a decreased CO2 and an increased pH, all with the focus of trying to bring up PaO2. So how would we fix this? We treat this patient with oxygen. If you correct the hypoxemia, you will correct this 7.50 CO2 of 28 will correct itself. Because when the body no longer feels the need of being hypoxemic, the respiratory rate and the central drive to breathe will slow down. And the CO2 will come back up to normal and the pH will come back down to normal. So yes, in this case, you treat it with giving oxygen to fix the acute hypoxemia. Now, let me give you another example. Your patient comes in, they come up with a blood gas that is acute alveolar hyperventilation. 
Their PAO2 is 110. Is this patient acutely hyperventilating because they are hypoxemic? Absolutely not. So this is probably more anxiety or pain related. Okay, so that's what you got to look at. Is my patient acutely hyperventilating? Yes or no. Is it due to hypoxemia? Yes or no. If it is, then give oxygen and fix the hypoxemia. If it's not, then we got to fix something else. What's the pain coming from? What's the anxiety? Do we need to give medications to treat those? Do we need to take away those things? It could be a, a, big, a big broad spectrum of things, and we got to ask ourselves, why is this patient hyperventilating? It's not because of hypoxemia, period. It's not. So in this case, when it's not, what do we do? The answer is, oh, I don't know. You got to look at your patient, talk to your patient, find out. Is it anxiety? Is it pain? What is it? Okay. That's where we go with this. Now, the second question that Teresa asked was, when do I know to add mechanical dead space? Now, this is a question that I love because mechanical dead space is almost obsolete. Like we've almost completely quit talking about it. Okay. But the truth is, is that mechanical dead space is still a tool that every respiratory therapist should know. Now mechanical dead space, it can be excessive or it can be obsolete and you need to add it in times. So the question was, when do I add mechanical dead space? Okay. So we're going to go back here. Okay. So we're going to take a step back. And I'm going to do this. With this blood gas, your patient is acutely hyperventilating. And the question is why? And the answer is because they are acutely hypoxemic. So in this case, to fix, I mean, this sounds redundant, right? But it's not, trust me, because we're on to another question here. In this case, you need to fix the PAO2. When you fix that, you will fix the acute alveolar hyperventilation. So in this case, you should not be thinking about adding mechanical dead space. It's not going to fix the problem. The patient is hyperventilating because they are hypoxemic. Now, go to the other example. This patient is also acutely hyperventilating. Is it because of hypoxemia? No. Is it because of something else, such as anxiety or pain? Maybe so. We don't know. But this would be the better example to where you could add mechanical dead space. Adding mechanical dead space will cause your patient to rebreathe more exhaled CO2, which will cause their CO2 to go up. If the CO2 goes up, then the pH comes down and we present with a better blood gas. Now, does this fix the problem? Probably not. If it's, if it's head injury based or if it's anxiety based or pain injury based, you, pro you probably need to fix those, those issues. If it's head injury based, I don't even know if this will fix it. But to answer your question, this would be the scenario to add mechanical dead space because you don't need to give more oxygen because we're at 110. So the hyperventilation is not related to hypoxemia. So adding mechanical dead space will allow the CO2 to go up, the pH to come down, and hopefully fix your problem. Okay? So the bigger thing when it comes to mechanical dead space is understanding when mechanical dead space which is any volume of tubing between the pit ventilator Y and the patient's in the tracheal tube. Okay, that's what we talk about when we talk about mechanical dead space. And I just realized that I need to do a video over mechanical dead space, which will be coming up soon. Okay, so 
What we need to understand greater is that when mechanical dead space is causing too high of a CO2 and an acidotic pH, and it's because of all of this additional mechanical dead space, we need to be privy to reducing the mechanical dead space. If your board exams, the NBRC, are going to ask you anything about mechanical dead space, it's going to be a patient is acidotic, you have 200 mLs of mechanical dead space, what do you want to do to treat the fix the problem? And the answer is remove mechanical dead space because you have too much of it. You don't need 200 mLs of mechanical dead space. That's going to result in an increased rebreathing of exhaled CO2, which is going to increase in it, which is going to result in an increase in PaCO2, which is going to decrease your pH. So the answer is get all of that mechanical dead space out. Look for my next video. I'm going to talk about mechanical dead space because I've seen in clinic within the last 30 days unnecessary mechanical dead space related to the administration of aerosolized medications. Can't wait for you to see it. Teresa, thank you for asking this question. If anybody has any further questions, put them in the comments below. Hit the subscribe button and let me know what I can do for you. Best wishes.